Now that we're a, a couple minutes out from Gavilan, can we just make sure that all witnesses have their uh, cameras turned on, please, just so that we're ready when um, the chair gavels in. Thank you very much. Sound check. I can hear. Good morning, Miss Williams. Yeah, this is the Transportation Committee. We can see and hear you loud and clear, ma'am. Thank you very much, though. Thank you. You're welcome. Michelle Steele here, too. Can hear you loud and clear, ma'am. Thank you very much for checking. Thank you. Anytime. Weber is on board. And can hear you loud and clear as well, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Subcommittee will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions without objections, 
so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphones muted unless speaking. Should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I will request that the member please mute their microphones. To insert a document into the record, please have your staff email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. Good morning. When I had the honor of being selected by my colleagues to become the chairman of this subcommittee, one of my first priorities was seeing how I could bring equity to the rail sector. Unfortunately, I've, I've since learned that much work still needs to be done to ensure that everyone as a fair shot at obtaining work on federal passenger rail contracts. The first question I asked when I got the gavel was how we could strengthen the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program at the Federal, Re federal Railroad Administration. Imagine my surprise when I found out that there was no DBE program at the FRA. To be clear, today's hearing is not to debate the merits of creating a program. The purpose of today's hearing is to allow business owners to share their experiences of working in the rail sector. We're going to hear uncomfortable stories of very real discrimination that our witnesses have suffered. Today, our responsibility is to listen and reflect on each person's experience. I'd be remiss if I didn't share my own experience. The question is often asked, how do you know when you are being discriminated against? I know as a black man, I know that feeling when people treat you differently because of the color of your skin. I know that when companies conspire against a supplier to shut out the only minority firm manufacturing a particular product, you're being discriminated against. I was fortunate because of the government intervention that particular discrimination was stopped, although others have not been so lucky. The experiences we are going to hear today from our panel will be different than mine. The point of holding this hearing is to try to understand someone else's experience. I do not know what it is like to experience discrimination as a member of a different minority group or what discrimination women face in industry, in an industry dominated by men. That is why we have invited a diverse panel of witnesses to share their unique experiences. I commend our witnesses for being courageous enough to share extremely personal and often painful experiences that should not happen in any setting, and at least of all, in professional settings. It is not easy to come forward and describe discrimination when discrimination has happened to you, but it is necessary, it's a necessary story to tell. I encourage all members to listen closely to these experiences. Some members may have gone through similar things and others may have not. We can't change what happened to our witnesses, but we have the privilege and the responsibility of being able to correct these injustices to ensure the future generations will be playing on a level field. What I want to prevent are instances of where business owners decide that it isn't even worth trying to bid for work because they know that they will be judged by what they look like. 
rather than the quality of their work. I commend the Biden administration for taking bold steps to ensuring diversity and inclusion. Secretary Buttigieg has committed to working with me and this committee to identify ways to create a fair shot to compete for federal rail contracts. Information gathered from today's hearings will help inform Congress whether actions must be taken to address discrimination in the transportation sector. It is my sincere hope that today, members can put themselves in other people's shoes, if just for a moment, to understand the damage a well-entrenched system of discrimination can cause to business owners simply trying to provide for their families and succeed in the rail industry. Some uncomfortable conversations need to be had to bring about a positive result. These conversations are not easy, but they are necessary. I again thank the witnesses for being here, and I look forward to their testimony. I now call on the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Crawford, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Payne, and uh, for, for holding the hearing. Thank you to our witnesses for participating today. Today's hearing will examine the need for a disadvantaged business enterprise or DBE program within the Department of Transportation for passenger rail contractors to ensure equal and fair access to government grant money for rail infrastructure projects. The DBE program currently applies to airport construction, airport concessions, and surface transportation construction programs, but does not to passenger rail work. This committee has demonstrated a bipartisan commitment to DBE programs and to promoting fair and full access to transportation contracting opportunities. While the Federal Rail Administration doesn't currently have statutory authority to administer a DBE program for passenger rail, the FRA has demonstrated its support of the DBA program objectives. The 2015 FAST Act directed the FRA to conduct a nationwide disparity and availability study on participation by minority women and veteran owned small businesses in federally funded inner city passenger rail transportation projects. The study will inform Congress on whether legislation is needed to create a DBA pro DBE program for passenger rail contracting. I commend the chair for holding the hearing today and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. DeFazio. Okay, um, I've been notified that Mr. DeFazio won't be joining us. And so we will now turn to our witnesses and we will uh, be hearing testimony from witnesses followed by questions from members. I would now like to welcome our witnesses. Mr. Ken Canty, President and CEO of Janice Materials. Mr. Melvin Clark, Chairman and CEO of GW People's Contracting Company. Ms. Victoria Maluzicki, President and CEO of Envision Consultants. And Mr. Francisco, Atiro, President and CEO of Paco Group, and Mr. Nana Desikin Raman, Raman Ujan. And he is the President and CEO of SOMAT Engineering. And last but not least, Ms. Evelyn Williams, President of Dakita Enterprises. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Since your written testimony has been made a part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Five minutes. Mr. Canty, you may proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Whether it be the actions of Frederick Douglass in 1855, Rosa Parks a century later, or John Fitzgerald Johnson today, 
our country has a vigorous tradition of standing up to protest and advocate for marginalized peoples. This morning, we find ourselves at a comparative inflection point in the rail and infrastructure industry. My name is Kenneth B. Canny. I'm the president of Janus Materials. Janus, by using a process we have coined sustainable structural demolition and repurposing, deploys material from demolished bridges to com combat climate change through net zero carbon solutions. I am also the president of AMC Civil Corp in Freeland Construction. I've been involved in this business and field since 1995, when I was hired as an engineering intern from UMass Amherst by Parson Brinkeroff to work on the design of what became known as the Big Dig. From a very young age, my life dream was to work on bridges, as you can see behind me. This moved from being a dream to a reality due to the experience I had with my father, a World War II Pacific combat veteran, as he would take me on with him as a six-year-old child on a long drive from Boston to Baltimore to see his ailing mother. We would go over the George Washington Bridge, down the New Jersey Turnpike to the Delaware Memorial Bridges. It was these occurrences that inspired me to be a bridge engineer. I, I was a beg my dad to take the routes that were out of the way, like the Bay Bridge in Annapolis, to check it off the list. I was able, through working on the big dig, I went down to Charleston to work on the Cooper River Bridges. And to make a long story short, I was able to use these experiences and qualifications to purchase my first business. Went into the 8A program, grew the company from four people to over 50 in four years. We were working for the, for the Department of Defense, Agriculture, Homeland Security, and the GSA, to name a few, for the express purpose of working with the railroad. As the railroads have a very high barrier of entry, and rightfully so, due to the extremely dangerous work it is and the impact it has on the traveling public, we made sure we had enough past performance working capital and qualified personnel to approach Amtrak. We approached Amtrak in 2011, and after three years, we awarded our first contract in 14 to reconstruct railroad stations from Gainesville, Georgia, Georgia, Prince, West Virginia, throughout South Carolina and North Carolina. We also pursued work in North Dakota, Texas, Florida, and Washington, D.C., as well as Connecticut. I must point out to this committee, my path was very different than others, as I was able to use an established program that provides for provides a path for a protected class of citizens, the 8A program. Furthermore, I was the work I was doing for Amtrak still existing in the framework as what we call vertical work, which is a place many minority contractors can succeed. However, my end goal remains horizontal work, which is bridges and tunnels and large assets that hardly any black contractors get into. I submit to this committee that there's a concentrated coordinated effort by large prime contractors and sometimes in conjunction with owners to keep minority contractors, particularly black contractors, out of federally funded infrastructure industry, particularly rail. While others testifying today have certainly documented these actions, I would like to focus my unfortunate set, set of experiences um, in the heavy civil industry. It is no coincidence there is a dearth of minority contractors who are in the rail industry. The majority of these minority contractors are usually taken out before they can even qualify for work for the railroads and usually under the auspices of the state DBE programs. I fully realize and accept that prime contractors do not want this conversation to be had. I also understand that I'm likely to suffer an extreme backlash from these prime contractors and maybe even owners for coming before this committee and subcommittee. I accept this risk no matter what the cost. I stand before you knowing that this committee is the only body that can act positive change for the Minority Business Committee and the United States as a whole. Too often, these prime contractors are not punished for the behavior I will showcase below, but are rewarded with hundreds of millions of dollars of more work. My experience, I will, my experiences range in South Carolina, throughout South Carolina, but I'm gonna tell, take my remaining time to talk to you about what happened in Florida. We were contracted to demo a bridge in Florida by a firm many of you may be familiar called Scanska. We started experiencing racial discrimination that went from simple acts of what may be called tomfoolery to uh, erasing ignition codes off machines that quickly accelerated to sinking of boats, sabotage of equipment, which we caught on video and has been submitted to this committee, and uh, harassment by a tugboat that coincidentally was named after who is purported to be one of the high ranking members of the Ku Klux Klan and the Confederate War General Albert Pike. We were demeaned on a regular basis and my, I myself suffered this behavior. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you are aware that Skanska maybe inadvertently is being rewarded for the behavior by being 
by receiving a contract from New Jersey Transit for $1.5 billion for the construction of the North Portal Bridge. Why would anybody think that this behavior that displayed would go away? Finally, I'd like to just, to act, just take 30 seconds and tell you that the financial implications of this have been huge. We have, in addition to myself, companies in Louisiana, such as TK Towing, Cashman Equipment in Massachusetts, International Product, Power Products in Maine, companies in Florida, urban advisors in North Carolina have suffered greatly through this. I am in the midst of losing my house. I cannot provide care for my autistic children. And my wife has had to go back to work um, as opposed to raising the children. I have not been able to make a payroll. And I'm afraid that with the Infrastructure Act that was just passed, I'm not gonna be able to participate at all despite all of the great hard one experience I have. Thank you for this opportunity. And I sincerely pray that it spurs action by this body. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that compelling testimony. Next, we will hear from Mr. Melvin Clark. Mr. Clark, you're muted. Unmute. All right, good morning again. Good morning. I am the, I am the chairman, CEO, and owner of GW People's Contracting Company. Uh, we are the only African-American-owned rail contractor in the United States specializing in heavy rail construction, maintenance, repair, rehabilitation, and track demolition. Um, we've worked all over the country. I want to thank uh, the chairman, Dr. Payne, to um, having this hearing. Uh, I have been working and advocating a minority business program in at FRA for over 30 years. Uh, it's been, I've been in this industry close to 40 years. So following the passage of the Reagan Administration Surface Transportation Act, I started a company called Metroplex. And Metroplex was the first minority owned railroad contractor in the United States. And we grew to be a nationally known and respected leader uh, in this field. Uh, during uh, the time, from the time we started the company, I was a very strong minority business advocate. Uh, we did a number of things with SBA and DOT. However, we were, our most significant um, success was starting the mentor protege program at SBA. Uh, it was implemented during the Clinton administration and um, Metroplex mentored my current company now, GW Peoples. Uh, I ended up selling Metroplex uh, and coming back to GW People in 2011. And we acquired full control there. And it was a successful turnaround. We do over 22 million in annual sales. And we've been the real contractor for uh, the Chicago Transit Authority, for example, uh, we did um, the rehabilitation of the Dan Ryan Red Line. Uh, that was a very large project, $425 million to upgrade over 10 miles of the CTA system. Um, um, the transit uh, people and companies there at that time did not want any kind of minority company to come in and get any of the work. However, however we went through the chairman of CTA and others um, who granted us this opportun opportunity and we completed that job uh, with over 70% uh, minorities and women. Uh, it was uh, one in which everyone was so very proud of and we uh, had a established a place in Chicago. And despite the public support, 
where our transit workforce on track work reflected the, the neighborhoods and the ridership of color, uh, we were not successful in the highly in the heavy passenger rail market. Uh, and the private railroads usually reserve the high profile, high profit and labor intense work for themselves. Uh, and uh, for example, in Chicago, there was a project called the Inglewood Flyover. Uh, it was a $93 million system of bridges and to carry the Rock Island rail line over the Norfolk Southern Amtrak line. And it went through the heart of the south, south side of Chicago. Uh, when the local um, public found out the size of the project, which uh, 93 million, when they found out also that the African-American firms only received $112,000. Uh, we argued and, and advocated that they should have somebody of color there. We were more than qualified to do the work. However, uh, they chose, uh, they said they had no obligation to meet any kind of minority participation goals and uh, they paid no more than lip service uh, to minority businesses in the community and uh, it ended up um, really being a mess. Uh, one of the um, congressional supporters that we have now in Chicago, Bobby Rush was able to help make a change uh, there in uh, their um, policies. Um, however, uh, there really is still nothing uh, happening for us, uh, asking for us. So anyway, uh, as I said, I've been a minority business advocate for the time period I've been in business. Uh, I've served on all of the um, uh, national organizations uh, with regard to trade organizations, uh, with regard to rail. And for example, uh, at one of the organizations, I was on the legislative committee. And one of the goals of the committee was to lobby to eliminate the DBE programs altogether at DOT and at uh, the Defense Department. Excuse me, Mr. Clark. Uh, could you could you wrap up? Uh, your time is uh, has expired. So just give us a, a, a quick summation. Right. Well, well, I'm going to give you a quick summation of what I was going to say, and there, there were two major hot high-speed rail projects that you may know about in Florida and in Las Vegas. Both, both were going to use GW Peoples to do the track work until they found out they did not have any kind of minority participation goals. Thus and therefore, we were shut out of this. And, um, and I can't think of a better example of discrimination and the need for uh, a policy here for minority business um, than that. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move on to Ms. Malazicki. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Victoria Malazicki and I am the president and CEO of Envision Consultants. My company is certified as a small woman owned disadvantaged business enterprise in my home state of New Jersey and nine other states. We are headquartered in Mullica Hill, New Jersey and have an office in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We are now approaching 27 years in business with 47 employees and anticipate closing the year at 7.3 million in revenue. We work in the architectural engineering and construction industry, providing program and construction management services. Our market sectors include aviation, bridges, general buildings, educational K through 12, higher education, highway, transit, water, wastewater, and technology. I realized that I have become desensitized to the systemic discrimination that happens daily to me based on my gender. I thought that because I have worked hard, started from nothing, raised a family, 
and am running a successful business that I am respected and equal to a man, but I am not. Every day I must prove myself to owners, clients, and most disheartening a few employees who have come and gone. I was almost put out of business by a large prime and moved the operations into my home to meet payroll and cut costs. To this day, I don't know how I survived that year, but I did. I could have thrown in the towel were it not for my family supporting me. I would not be here today if it were not for statutory requirements for women-owned businesses. Business is business, and the third certifications do not guarantee work, but they level the playing field, allowing me to be in the game. The discrimination that continues daily is so subtle that is overlooked. The anger, hostility, and hate from men when confronted by me is, I believe, grounded in disrespect. Yet this behavior is not all men. What is concerning to me today is recognizing this hostility and disrespect to women on my management team and the young women entering the workforce. I must incorporate annual training in this area of discrimination that is not sexual. I would never have thought in 2021 that this is what is needed for workplace culture. The industry continues to be male dominated at all levels. I must be well versed in all aspects of business operations when many of the men I'm working with only need to be knowledgeable in one aspect. A few of the daily experiences I encounter after all these years are what is your education? What is your background? What can you do for me? You are not allowed to speak to any division of the agency or owner. You are not allowed to attend the pre-proposal meetings. 99% of the time, I do not receive a copy of the submitted proposal. I hear that we negotiated your rates and fee. We request you to start work without an executed contract. And too many times, the dollar values assigned to my firm in winning a proposal never result in any revenue. In conclusion, my story reflected in the written testimony identifies that discrimination against women exists in this industry and that there is a need for establishing goals in federal passenger rail contracting. Envision has only pursued two procurements in federal passenger rail in 27 years of doing business. If this arena opens to include small women and minority owned businesses like other agencies of the government, such as the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration, I would have pursue additional contracts. If there is no incentive to utilize firms like mine, they will not be utilized. The large private, national, and global firms will continue to strengthen and dominate this market via mergers and acquisitions, performing 100% of the work on their own. With only a few large players winning and performing the work, more and more conflicts of interest will arise. This is an opportunity only if the agency is ready to procure with a small woman or minority owned firm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will hear from Mr. Francisco Atiro. Uh, good morning um, uh, to the committee. Um, my name is Francisco Otero. I am the founder, president, and CEO of the Paco Group. Paco is a minority-owned and certified disadvantaged business enterprise that provides program and construction management consulting services. I started my company in 1989. Our headquarters are in New York City, and we maintain a regional office in Miami, Florida. My company specializes in providing project controls and related services nationally the federal, state, local, and municipal government agencies that are involved in the design and construction of infrastructure and transportation projects. My company functions typically as an extension of an agency staff helping to protect their interests during the planning, design, bid award, and construction phases of a project. Our services are intended to provide uh, independent oversight support to the agency by monitoring and tracking the project's cost, schedule, and quality performance. My personal business experience is that almost, uh, most, almost, it's almost impossible to compete with majority firms on federally funded projects. 
due to their size, resources, and financial capabilities. I can honestly and emphatically attest to the fact that had it not been for the FPA's federally mandated DPE program, my company probably would not have been able to get started, much less survive for over 31 years. If you require proof, just look at the private sector of the construction industry where no DBE goals exist, and you will, be, you will find barely any meaningful minority firms participation. The DBE program provided my company the opportunity to subcontract with majority firms on federally funded FTA construction projects and has been the lifeline for contracting opportunities. As a matter of fact, the FTA's DBE program has enabled my company to participate on numerous high profile mega projects, including Puerto Rico Strangobano, New Jersey Transit Hudson Light uh, uh, Bergen Light Rail System, New Jersey Transit Southern New Jersey Light Rail System, uh, New York's Eastside Access Program, New York's Second Avenue Subway, and many, many other projects. One would think that with the impressive resume of successful projects that my company has compiled over the years would be adequate testimonial demonstrating the depth of our experience, capabilities, and qualifications. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. DBEs are relegated to seeking subcontracting opportunities with majority firms uh, and our teaming success to a large part depends on the majority firm's willingness and corporate culture towards diversity and inclusion. For the record, I do not expect any contracts opportunity to be handed to me. I do feel and, and I don't feel any sense of entitlement. I freely and willingly embrace competing for work. I just expect the competition to be fair and that it provide a level playing field. I must admit that I do have a serious problem with and find completely unacceptable the way I am treated and, and disrespectfully, rudely, and dismissive by many majority firms. I have on several occasions had a majority firm come right out and tell me they wish the DBE program would go away so that they would not have to bother te teaming with firms like myself that they would prefer being able to subcontract with whoever they want and not be forced to subcontract with DBE firms. They have gone so far as to state that DBEs are lazy, that the quality of their work is inferior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All very stereotypical attitudes. I, uh, due to time, I'll only mention one example, but in my written testimony, there are many other examples of the type of discrimination that we face. So in conclusion, Recognizing that small business sector is the economic engine driving the nation's economy, it is important that DBEs can com competitively participate on FRA federally funded railroad projects. The roles and opportunities that the FRA projects can provide will vary from track construction to engineering, design to procurement of supplies, all that are intended to strengthen our rail systems nationally. This would mean millions of dollars for minority businesses and thousands of jobs from the minority community. PACO is ready, willing, and able to participate in FRA projects once the DBE program is implemented. I strongly encourage the Congressional Subcommittee to establish an FRA DBE program so that minority-owned businesses such as myself will have the opportunity to participate on these federal projects as well. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll have Mr. Nana Tasikin Rahman, Rahman Uja. Thank you, sir. 1776, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is from the Declaration of Independence. Greetings, Chairman Payne and members of your committee. My name is Ram, and I'm the president and CEO of SOMAT Engineering. We are a minority-owned consulting engineering business headquartered in Detroit, Michigan, with offices in Cleveland, Ohio, 
Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. I start by saying, in business, both parties, in fact, all parties must get some benefit. That is an absolute must. My written testimony regarding the bias against minority firms and our difficulty to get work in the railroad industry is with your committee. I presented three specific instances where I explicitly experienced how it feels to be treated differently because of how I look or how I sound. Number one, I was told to stay in my disadvantaged slash minority lane and not aspire to grow in my profession and to compete with others. Number two, I was saddled and I am saddled even right now with different and unfair terms from uh, all kinds of uh, business partners, such as my financial institution, that many of my other non-minority uh, competitors do not have to face. Number three, I found out about the racist and the sexist communication that goes on behind the veneer of civility. It is couched as humor, but it is there. But I am not here to complain. I'm here to answer questions and to help make the case that a DBE program is essential to level the playing field for minority firms in the railroad industry. I am often asked how many times have I directly experienced discrimination in writing or to my face verbally? My answer is not by a person in a position to give work out, no. But that is not surprising because someone, anyone who is engaged in questionable behavior is unlikely to do so explicitly. The discrimination is subtle. It is unspoken. I just heard a new term recently, unconscious bias, subconscious bias, whatever it may be. However, it is present. It can be inferred. How? By the work that we get, or rather I should say, the lack of work that we have gotten. I'm also asked to explain many times how a minority firm like SOMAT has been successful. We have offices in four cities, like I mentioned. If there is discrimination, how did this happen? But please note, chairman and members, the cities that we work in, Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, and Washington, DC. It is not by accident that we work in four majority minority cities. We focus our energies on where we feel welcome, not where we are looked down upon. Our scriptures call this, in my language, Dukkha Nivriti and Sukha Prapti. We move away from that which is unpleasant and towards what is pleasant. Despite 35 years of recognitions and awards and a track record of performing higher end engineering services, such as expert review, expert witness, value engineering, we have performed zero, zero work for the railroad industry and on FRA funded projects. To me, this speaks volumes. Well, I end as I began by saying that in business, all parties must benefit. This program is not an entitlement program and those who do not perform DBE or not must be weeded out. The FRA and the industry will reap the benefit of competition and innovation with this inclusive action. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a very important point you made. This is about leveling the playing field and everyone having the opportunity to compete in this great nation. Uh, next, we will have uh, Ms. Evelyn Williams. Thank you and good morning. 
I am the president and CEO of Dakita Enterprises, a family owned minority engineering firm located in Dallas, Texas. We will celebrate our 42nd year in business this month. In the transit and rail industry, we provide civil rail design, rail program and construction management, and transit market research. My father, Lucius Williams, founded the firm in 1979 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and moved the firm to Dallas, where I was attending college in 1983. I am currently the ex an executive board member of APTA, which is the American Public Transportation Association, and I am the first American, uh, African American female to chair APTA's business member board of governors. When we started the business in 1979, minority programs such as the Minority Business Enterprise Program was the only way we could get work. Sadly, today, that continues to be the main driver. I remember my father applying for certification in 1983 and having to report on paper his recollections of how he was discriminated against. It was, the, it was one of the many requirements of the long arduous certification process. I recall how painful it was for him then and how I learned about the awful experiences he had endured. In the 40s, when my father was younger, he played for the old Negro Baseball League and played for the Memphis Reds. He explained about being called racial slurs and having to go around the back to get leftovers from diners. When, when, we, when he was on the road, they weren't allowed to go into the white owned establishments or sleep in regular motel beds. He and his team often slept on, in, in, on the bus or in cars. I think this is where my children and I get our can do, don't stop, get it done attitude. Being pioneers as the first black firm to get government contracts or one of them, we were often targeted. We survived, however, despite the many hurdles we had to climb. Hurdles that are extra because we are a black engineering firm. Unless you walk in my shoes, you have no idea how unconscious the typical non-minority is about understanding these microaggressions. I remember less than a decade ago, we, complete, we competed for a project from a mid-sized transit system in another state. We did our homework, we understood the local politics, and we won the project. During the negotiations, however, we ran into a problem. While our fees were acceptable and our references did check out, the procurement officer was not comfortable in awarding us the project. He asked me for my tax returns, my financials, my banking credentials. This was not typical. And as I gathered this information, I became angry. I called his boss who I knew through transit associations and I complained. And when the officer called back, his tone had changed. I asked him, why were you treating me so differently? He told me and confessed that he had never awarded such a large project to a black company. And he was just trying to ensure that we were financially able. The DBE programs provides equity and which in turn helps to build financial capacity and workforce resources. However, being called disadvantaged is not a privilege, nor does it sound like a goal a company would strive to be. Quite frankly, it was embarrassing explaining this to my 22-year-old millennial, why we were considered a disadvantaged business. It was then that I had the opportunity to recall my experiences as my father recalled some 35 years earlier. Fast forward, it's only a matter of time that she has now begun to have her own stories. Large corporations would self-perform 100% of the work if left unchecked, just as they do in the private sector. Once I was a member of a panel discussing the merits of the, of the DBE program. The panel was comprised of industry professionals. To my surprise, one of the panelists of a very large firm openly admitted that if it was not for the DBE program, they would not subcontract to DBE firms. He felt as though there should not be such a program and that the entire process was not warranted. He did not see this as discrimination, but his right to contract as he pleased. His remark, it was hurtful, but it was not surprising. These are just a few episodes regarding practices that either keep minority firms small 
or run them out of business, especially African-American firms. Regarding work on the FRA, we've only had one project about 10 years ago. It was a customer satisfaction survey for Amtrak. But the fact that the RF, uh, FRA does not have a DBE program speaks volumes as to why we only had sit one single program in the last 42 years. The services and skill sets we offer to, to FTA and FAA funded projects are much transferable to the FRA rail projects. And I hope that the FRA will continue or will, excuse me, will adopt a race conscious DBE program. Thank you very much. We will now move on to um, members' questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes, and I will start by recognizing myself. I ask unanimous consent to include, for the record, the written statement of the Association of American Railroads, American Railroads, without objection, so ordered. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, let me start by commending you for being here today and publicly sharing what is certainly an uncomfortable and unsettling experience. It is deeply troubling to hear um, that your company did not receive fair consideration for a project because, uh, because there was no minority participation goal. If these goals were in place for projects and you had the opportunity to fairly compete, in what ways do you think that would uh, have changed your business? One of the things that um, is troubling and is often a challenge for small and minority contractors is the ability to for sustainability. As you know, in our arena, we live by projects, projects after projects. And the only way that you can be uh, truly sustainable and successful in this business is by having continuous work. By having continuous work, you're able to have the workforce um, to move from one project to the other. Many times what happens to small businesses and African-American businesses is that the, when the project's over, many times you do not get that continuity between projects, so you end up losing your, your workforce. And you know what's worse? What happens more than often is that your staff is now absorbed by your prime, your, your prime cons contractor, your prime consultant. You look around, and your people are working for their people and advancing, and there you are left getting, you know, looking for more people. So Thank that's... You the major reason why I think it would change. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kenny, I found your testimony quite profound in that you knew from a young age that you wanted to work in the rail space and continue to do so despite the racial discrimination you have suffered. One of my priorities in uh, examining racial discrimination in the federal passenger rail contracting space is ensuring that minority men and women owned businesses have opportunities to build capacity and grow as large as multinational construction firms. If minority contractors like yourselves were not systematically excluded from the same kind of starting opportunities that were given to large multinational construction firms, what impact would that have? In 2014, where we had reached 15, where we'd reach our apex, uh, particularly when we're doing work with Amtrak, we were trending at 38 employees. Um, we were in 14 different states, five regional offices, and we're working on an international office in Bulgaria. Um, if we had been allowed to continue to move forward without these, uh, without this discrimination, we would have been we would have been um, definitely probably into our fifth or sixth large bridge demolition contract. The first one we did was in Charleston, South Carolina in 2016 to 2017. Um, we would have been probably a force of 50 to 100 employees at least. Definitely would have been in the 20 to $30 million range. 
and we would have actually been knocking on the door of not be qualifying for the DBE program anymore, which is the whole point of the program is not to qualify for it. We would have, um, our goal was by 2024 that we would have been exiting 2018 to 2024, we would have been exiting the DBE program. So um, we would have been playing a major role in a major employer, particularly in, in uh, black and brown communities, um, because we did have a program of hiring folks from the, we had a, literally a, a, a prison to work pipeline that we had uh, enacted where we were hiring folks coming out because construction is one of the industries that you can start from the bottom and go right to the top no matter what your background is. Um, I, I have to tell you, the places we would have been would have been unlimited. The construction business with all its issues is still one of those businesses that you can do very well in if you work hard as long as you don't have to do, deal with the systemic discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I will go to the ranking member, Mr. Crawford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, appreciate the opportunity. I just want um, to, to any other panel that want to comment, what would you identify as the, the single biggest barrier that minority and women-owned contractors face in receiving contractors, are, are uh, receiving contracts for passenger rail projects? Well, uh, sir, the, it is a classic case of the chicken or the egg. It is extremely difficult to compete for business when we cannot show any experience. And, and we cannot show any experience because we have no opportunity to get it. So uh, a lot of times that is what I have been told that, uh, you know, you, we, you know, we like you, but you do not have the experience. That has been a challenge for us. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I would uh, also add uh, the financial constraints, some of them particularly unique to the uh, minority business community. So in order to, to, to get funding, in, in including bonding, you have to have a certain net worth. Um, or if you don't, then you basically hand over everything you own except a chair and four tables to the bonding company. And, um, but in order to be a DBE, you can't exceed a certain net worth. So what we're finding is you get in, even if you get the financial background, these uh, sometimes the owners, but definitely these primes are using the bonding company in a term from the 1980s called bond them and break them. They'll bond you, they'll break you through the contract, you'll lose everything you have, and you can't even start over at that point. Um, I think the financial constraints are one of the biggest um, biggest barriers of entry. And the rail work it requires significant insurance, and that shouldn't change. But there's got to be um, there's got to be some look look at how you can be financially viable and not get have it used against you. Ms. Williams, any anything to add? Um, I wanted to ask you um, to repeat the question, please. Sure. Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of what you find to be the, the, the single biggest barrier to being able to um, compete in, in receiving those contracts for passenger rail projects. Um, I, I, I don't know if you're speaking of within uh, the DBE uh, uh, that arena that has established a DBE program, or you mean uh, the FRA non-established? Well, uh, we, since we, we've established that the FRA doesn't have a DBE, and, and so I'm just trying to, to gauge the degree of difficulty and, and what the single biggest barrier in that space uh, outside of the DBE, uh, what you find the most challenging. Probably you're the, the um, we probably can, <laughs> Go back and look and see who's getting the projects and they're probably the same guys that are getting the projects every time and um, as long as they're getting them every time and then they don't have any kind of goal to uh, bring anybody new or bring in smaller or minority companies they'll continue doing what they're doing so the barrier is that there is a barrier nobody's going to 
<laughs> if I've been getting a contract for years and years, why would I bring on a small minority company? So the barrier is because it, it, there is no incentive to That's do anything different. Mr. Clark, anything to add? First of all, I agree with all our panelists here, and, but I have to break it down to uh, a matter of greed. Um, the prime contractors do not want to, uh, to sub out any work that they do because that's where they make uh, the most money. So they want to relegate you to uh, smaller you know, uh, uh, areas such as uh, trucking, uh, or maybe supplying materials. We as a rail contractor uh, want to do uh, rail projects and, and we perform well when we give an opportunity. But if they don't have to, unless they have an incentive to give out work where they do, they will not. And uh, we find that to be uh, a barrier to uh, moving forward. There are some companies that have made it a habit of not giving out anything related to what they may do. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's more difficult for us to break into the market. And if we, if we do break into the market, then we become a hindrance to everybody there. And now everybody has to listen to us and uh, listen to us uh, try and come in and do the work. Thank you, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we will now move on to Mr. Carson for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I really appreciate uh, the testimony today and the leadership of our Chairman uh, Payne. Um, what do you all think would be most Im the most impactful way to increase the number of black and brown professionals in the rail sector overall? And, and the passenger rail sector in particular. Uh, is this led by industry or is there more action needed from the FRA or DOT or even Amtrak to better implement programs that are already in place and, and, and what new efforts might we consider? And what can the subcommittee uh, do to advance diversity in, in aviation? I'd like to uh, answer that. Uh, one of the things that has to happen is um, what I see, and, and I have to commend uh, the agency that has given me probably my biggest leg up and the most work, and that's Dallas Area Rapid Transit. And what they do is it starts at the top. It starts with the CEO. It starts at the board level. And it is encouraged. Everyone knows who goes to work for DART that you're going to start off with the goal, but that's the minimum, that's the floor. You're not gonna win if the goal is 30% and you come in with 30%. And case in point, we had a project um, that we had, um, I ended up as a joint venture partner, 50-50, and um, uh, we brought on 15 different minority subs. We saved the agency $4 million and we brought it in two months ahead of time. And the participation on that project was 61%. That doesn't happen unless it starts from the top down. President O'Carter, this is Ram. Uh, trickle down economics just does not seem to work when it comes to getting work with the railroad sector. So to your question, would industry be uh, uh, right people to take the charge? Uh, we have not seen that be effective. It has to be basically both a carrot and a stick approach from the federal government to uh, ensure that there is some incentive for smaller minority firms to get some work. So that, that is what we feel. Kenneth Candy with Janice. Um, you know, you've you've got these, a lot of these bad actors out there and they're typically large, large companies because they get away with this stuff. And um, I think the most effective thing you can do is make it part of the, um, the criteria for picking companies to do this work. If they have any of this in their background, it needs to be used um, in evaluating if you want to use them for work because correspondingly, 
there are some real good firms out there, medium, medium size, two, three hundred million dollar range. Who, who they started off as small guys and they're not necessarily minority, but they started off as small guys and they just don't tolerate this stuff. They just don't tolerate it because they're, they're a bit come in and work and we're going to give you a fair chance. And they haven't gotten so big where the racism is actually profitable to them. That's the thing is the racism is profitable and discriminatory acts are profitable to these people. That's why they continue doing it. They don't, they do it because it's profitable. So you've got, I think this committee the agencies but through the leadership of this committee have to make that, even if you hear about it, it needs to be answered because where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, that's helpful. Um, lastly, um, I, I'm proud to represent the largest rail maintenance facility uh, in Beach Grove, Indiana, one of the cities in my district uh, where they repair locomotives and passenger rail cars. They do great work there. Um, we'd like to see them do more, but there appears to be a closed process that's, that's really hard to break if you don't know someone at the facility. And this challenge isn't unique to our district. Uh, it's a challenge for many facilities across the country, uh, particularly as it relates to hiring black and brown applicants. Um, what, what, what can be done to open these doors wider so we can bring in more diverse workers? This is an Amtrak maintenance facility, by the way. Well, I think it's incumbent upon us as minority contractors to reach out and try and train uh, individuals who are interested in the uh, work, for example, in the rail industry. Um, we did the maintenance on the WMATA contract uh, when they had the uh, uh, the work that they had to complete very quickly, uh, the fast track part work. And we went to a trade, trade school uh, in Brooklyn uh, and brought down over 50 students who had just graduated. And we gave them the opportunity to learn. We trained them, uh, we gave them housing. Uh, and these graduates did a wonderful job for us um, uh, as we completed the work successfully, uh, and many of them now have careers uh, in doing track work. Um, so we took it upon ourselves to uh, do this. Uh, and now we do have another maintenance contract. We're just starting today uh, with Shell. And we have several people that were coming down to work on this project that we gave the opportunity to work in Washington two years ago. So uh, we have done this ourselves. I think there should be some kind of incentive uh, to um, hire workers and train them uh, some kind of tax credits or something like that that would make a difference to the contractor and will make a difference in pricing that we would give to the prime contractors. Thank you. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Thank chair you, now recognizes Mr. LaMaffa for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, I, I appreciate uh, working with you and ever since we've known each other the first at the beginning, uh, beginning of our times in Congress together. So uh, I just, uh, I would like to uh, Get Mr. Clark's attention for my questions on this here. So uh, I am um, basically what, what we're looking at here in California is the high speed rail system that's uh, been troubled from the very beginning. But um, early early on in the project, uh, it was constantly accused of not getting uh, minority companies involved. So in 2010, a civil rights coalition claimed only 12 of 134. 12 out of 134 prime contractors were uh, minor, minority owned firm, firms. So last week, the LA Times published a piece uh, going into detail on the impacts it's been having on the communities themselves. We have uh, disadvantaged communities that are seeing uh, issues <clears throat> with the way the system is uh, doing business. So for example, in agriculture, farmers are having their land taken 
through eminent domain, yet it's taking years and years for them to get paid for it. The project is going through uh, a lot of low-income neighborhoods, just uh, you know, uh, black neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods. Um, it took down, you know, in some cases, some very important uh, uh, institutions, like in Fresno, the rescue mission there, for example, which helps a lot of people as a homeless shelter in the Central Valley. <clears throat> and um, Bakersfield's going to lose a homeless shelter here soon. So the impact on communities is really tough too. So the project is also, also at some point supposed to go through San Jose. And it's going to go right straight through a Latino neighborhood there. So these aren't uh, obviously temporary. They'll be uh, forever as long as the rail's around. So, um, and so for folks to get compensated for them to even be heard as to whether this is a good idea to go through a neighborhood and such, but coming back to the Fresno Rescue Mission, it took eight years in a lawsuit to get compensated for their being damaged the way they were, being basically eviscerated. So, uh, Mr. Clark, uh, and you, you're experienced in heavy rail. I'd like to see what you think about, um, you know, have, have your, uh, have the, anything you've been involved with ever been asked to build tracks through these types of neighborhoods, through these types of shelters and other things that are uh, pretty critical towards uh, the communities we're talking about here, and have they been held accountable for doing that kind of damage? Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, in my initial testimony, I talked about what we did in Chicago. Uh, we worked uh, with the Urban League, we worked with the churches, we worked with the community organizations to recruit and vet uh, minorities and women. And um, again, we took them. Um, and train them on the job, on the job training. That's what we gave them. Uh, and they ended up working so very well that our prime contractor, who was one of the largest in the world, had to go home for two weeks. I mean, they had sent us home for two weeks so they could catch up uh, with us. Now, we okay. did that, we did that uh, because we wanted to make sure the community was well, one benefiting with regard to the sort of uh, uh, to, to the work and, and opportunities that we could give them, uh, but also to make sure that our reputation was such that we do more than just work. We try to really make an impact in the community. We try to make sure our, our, our workforce looks like our ridership. So everywhere we've gone, not just Chicago, uh, we've done the same in Atlanta. We've done the same uh, with, with MARTA, the, the trans transit organization there. We've done the same at DART. Uh, uh, Ms. Williams testified about her 61 to 61% 61 uh, uh, minority workforce that was with her joint venture. Well, we yeah. did those two the same. This is what we do. We look to make a difference. We, uh, and when uh, Donald Trump came and uh, tried to uh, take away local workforce hiring, well, they were, you know, they were not, they wanted to, the major companies want to bring, bring in their workers and not really do anything for the community, you know. Right. We get that, that happens around here on, we have these issues with uh, the fires burning out the communities here in Northern California. That's really difficult to overcome. The barriers of small local companies, you know, no matter their makeup, to overcome the big on that with uh, getting contracts. My uh, a relative of mine has a small company, and he can hardly break into doing jobs in his unique business in the Bay Area, for example, because it's either you're too small or you're not in a union, for example. So we got issues across the board on that. So do you think, um, you know, as we've seen with high speed rail, they pretty much have basically ignored local concerns and don't involve local private companies. Um, you think that just lead to even more problems on the California project, or is that? Excuse you know, what do you me. Think about that? Excuse me, but the gentleman's time has expired. No, well, I was fast. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from the, the vice chair of the subcommittee, Ms. Strickland, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Payne and Ranking Member Crawford. Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement to enter into the record. Without objection. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your leadership in holding this important hearing today. 
And I especially want to thank all of the witnesses for your factual, compelling, and diverse stories of discrimination. The topic of this hearing today is, does discrimination exist in passenger rail contracting? And without having to even do a disparity study, I knew the answer was yes. And those who have testified have demonstrated that. We also know that you know, a lot of the racial and, racial and gender discrimination that exists through your stories and experiences, there are other people who have the same stories to tell, but they're just not here today. They've been denied contracts, opportunities, and fair consideration. And I sincerely thank all of our witnesses today. Mr. Clark, I'd like to start with a question for you. In your testimony, you noted that some of the success that GWP has had after you acquired control, including serving as the DBE rail contractor for Chicago Transit Authority. Can you please tell us about the differences your firm has experienced in pursuing projects with DBE programs like FTAs versus agencies that don't have the programs? Well, the agencies that don't have the program, this don't give us any opportunity to work. Uh, I uh, have been saying for a long time as an advocate that if they don't have to, they won't. They will not share in anything. Uh, there are so many prime contractors now, okay, that we have good relationships with uh, that only call us when they have a project that requires some kind of goal to be met. So uh, other than that, we don't have that opportunity. Or if, if we do bid them, and, uh, and sometimes we bid these contracts with uh, private, a, a private groups okay, and agencies, um, they don't tell you where you stand in your bid. They just say who's won the job, and uh, they move on. So we don't win those type of jobs. Uh, we will, we're very, actually, we're very seldom solicited. Uh, however, this week something new happened, last week, I'm sorry, and we were actually sent a solicitation from uh, Norfolk Southern, and we were knocked off our feet, okay, because we, we've been trying to get in to let them know what we do for the longest, and with a, it was a minority business representative. And we were shocked because they never had anything like that before. So I felt like what was going on, what's going on here today and what's been pushed by the Congressional Black Caucus uh, is starting to make a difference. People are recognizing that they're gonna have to uh, accept us uh, and we can make a difference. Uh, we feel that we have made a difference as a small contractor um, in, in, in several states. Thank you. Uh, I now want to turn to Mr. Canty. Sir, the examples of intimidation and blatant discrimination that you noted in your testimony is simply unconscionable. Could you talk more about the toll it takes on you as a contractor and a business owner about what it takes to pursue action against these actions and how it affects your ability to compete? Um, the toll it takes is um, everybody on this, on this uh, Zoom, at the end of the day, we're all a difference. We're all people, right? We're all people. And the toll it takes on a person is, is indescribable. It's, it's indescribable. It's the worst. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. Um, I, when I, we don't have time to get into it in totality, but the toll is indescribable. I mean, um, the toll it has on your families, the toll it has then on your ability to provide for your family, but your ability to provide for your employees it is huge. So um, there's a net ripple effect of bills that literally just can't get paid and net ripple effect of, and this is the reason I believe what was done to me was done was as far as I heart, and I forgot to mention you guys, I used to work for these guys as an employee for a joint venture. So I knew them and they knew me. And I had the first man and protege in the history of the United States DOT, uh, heavy civil with them. I think the reason why they do this is to make sure nobody else stands up because their racism, it is profitable. It is profitable. Thank so Thank you. And I, as, I, as, we, as we look at doing a DBE study, I also want to make sure that we're looking at both the carrot and stick. There must be enforcement and accountability. I yield back. Gentlemen, gentlewoman yields back and she's absolutely correct. Uh, next, we will have um, 
Miss Steele for five minutes. You unmute. Okay, next we will go to Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important hearing and thank you to the witnesses for your time and your testimony. I've been a longstanding advocate of the DOT's Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, which facilitates the success of women and minority-owned businesses throughout the transportation sector. Unfortunately, however, there is no DBE program for federal funds administered under the Federal Railroad Administration, the FRA, despite systemic discrimination based on race and sex that severely limits the economic prosperity of minority-owned businesses. Not only must Congress strengthen the existing DBE program under DOT, we must also establish a similar program under the FRA for the rail transportation industry, and this is crucial to mitigating inequality. Mr. Canty, your testimony asserts that discriminatory and unprofessional behavior by prime contractors has gone unpunished by Florida DOT, FDOT. And what's more, the FDOT has de demonstrated a willingness to ignore discriminatory complaints altogether, allowing bad actors to receive additional funding. Your firm has engaged in work across the East Coast and the South, including in my home state of Georgia. Based on your experience, how confident are you that the discriminatory experience, experience you were subjected to is representative of that experience by minority-owned firms across the country? I'm very confident of it because since my story has been told, I've had a plethora of folks send me information, um, send me information on it, um, including a picture of a noose on a job in LaGuardia by the same contractor which I was blown away by, I, I, you know, even with my experience of seeing what I've seen. So it's absolutely representative. I think maybe the difference with me a little bit is I came up under these folks, so I was able to document in the way they were able to document. And that way it, it didn't just get swept under the rug. And, um, you know, I'm no tougher than any other man or woman or anybody here. But, um, I mean, I, 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 you know, you just can't give up. And um, no matter what, one day somebody will hear it. Um, some places in the country are worse than others. Um, I, you know, um, a lot of reason nothing will change. Nothing changes is that chain of custody from the state to the uh, for them to really control it doesn't exist. Like in Florida, they okay. really don't have any control right. over okay. crime. So, okay, gotcha. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Mr. Ramanujam. Your testimony indicates the challenges DBE businesses face due to current limitations in the program, such as how size standards for small businesses have not been adjusted for inflation. How does the lack of a uniform DBE size standard diminish a minority-owned prime contractor's ability to compete with non-DBE firms? Thank you, sir. My uh, testimony referred to the time when we actually lost our DBE status. Uh, earlier, uh, and it has since uh, been adjusted, but it needs to be adjusted some more. To answer your question, the value of the dollar is not as much as it was before. We all know that, whether it's a gallon of milk or a gallon of gas. The projects that are coming out are much larger. And with the recent, uh, uh, and I thank all of you members here for passing the infrastructure stimulus, with the recent infrastructure stimulus, the projects are much, much larger. The size standards are not amenable or uh, uh, you know, uh, favorable for a small firm like ours to even get anything as a prime. We are constantly having to depend being a sub. And once you are dependent on being a sub, your destiny is not in your hands. So it has a very real, it has a very limiting and a very negative impact on small businesses to not have the size standard pegged into inflation. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Otero, I commend your leadership as a minority business owner for more than 30 years. 
How do you believe the existing DBE program can be strengthened to increase meaningful participation of businesses beyond subcontracting opportunities? Well, I, I, I think that what the program should also be focusing on is capacity building. Uh, you know, all too often we're given uh, subcontracting opportunities, to, but it's just a point here, a point there. Uh, and and, and it, that doesn't really help the small business in any way. Uh, there should be more of a mentoring uh, relationship, but the agency has to be the one who drives this kind of philosophy that says, okay, you're going to have 10 or five different subconsultants on this project, but what are their roles? That there is a meaningful role that that, that, that firm is going to provide that's going to help that firm grow its own capacity. Because if all you're doing is some menial type of task that is um, going to be what you're relegated to, it really, uh, all it's doing is satisfying the goal, but not achieving the true spirit of what the program is intended for, which is have meaningful participation so that these firms are growing and are able to eventually be uh, able to su survive on their own. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. And I expect Gentlemen's time is expiring. Uh, next, we have Mr. Achenkloss for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a timely hearing to hold. As three days ago, the House passed and the President signed into law an historic investment in our nation's infrastructure. The bipartisan infrastructure bill includes $66 billion for passenger and freight rail. Part of the bill's mission is to address the history of discrimination and how it has shaped our communities. The Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program was established under President Reagan, and yet four decades later, federal contracting awards are still struggling to include smaller businesses that strengthen local economies and create good jobs. Notably, this designation does not currently exist within the FRA, the Federal Rail Administration. As we make these new investments in rail made possible by VIF, especially the North South Rail and, um, excuse me, the South Coast Rail in Massachusetts and potentially East West or North South Rail as well, and further projects spurred by the passage of the infra infrastructure bill. We should not repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, for uh, Mr. Otero, you offered an idea in your testimony that the disadvantaged business enterprise program should not only provide subcontract subcontracting opportunities, but should also foster capacity building for DBE firms by providing meaningful participation. Can you expand more on that idea? And would yeah. there be incentives for the mentoring entity or a post mentorship evaluation for each participating company? Uh, uh, in my experience, uh, being in business for 32 years and being I'd say 80% of our work is as a subconsultant, 20% is prime. Um, all too often, uh, the prime thinks that by having 10, 15 subs on their proposal, that's the way to win. But, uh, and they may win, but the problem is what work is being divvied out to those 15 subconsultants is menial, okay? Uh, so, you know, what I try to talk to primes when they've uh, given me the opportunity to provide some input to how they're going to frame the team, I say, look at what are the scopes of services that you're going to uh, sub out and give it to one or two firms and, and approach it that way so that at the end of the day, I know I am responsible for the following work should we win. This way, it's in my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm using the staff and the capabilities that I have. Um, and, and I am building that capacity and providing a meaningful service that I feel very uh, capable of providing so that it's a win-win situation all around. Um, but a lot of times the primes don't want to look at it that way. They just want to have the 15 window dressing of firms on the team and what they wind up giving to them and how meaningful it is, is not part of their philosophy in terms of diversity and inclusion. That's helpful. I appreciate that insight. Uh, and then my final question for Ms. Malazeki, uh, you noted in your testimony 
that if the contracting arena becomes more tailored to support small woman and minority owned businesses, uh, like other agencies of government, your business would certainly pursue additional contracts. What can the FTA and the FHA do throughout these processes so that smaller businesses can equitably compete with the, with the bigger entities? Um, Congressman, right now I've been awarded two FTA contracts back to back five years as a prime contractor, nationwide contract for program management oversight. So to, to answer that question as to the FTA, they're already doing it. Um, it was a big learning curve. The, it starts with the procurement at the agency to, to assist someone like me to answer the questions. Um, we have to do all the other work, but there's a lot of administrative background to be a federal contractor. And the second time we went after the contract, we were, it was competitive and we're one of five small businesses out of 21 in the country that have this as a prime. Um, what occurs though, and many of the people speaking today, is it changes the game because the large prime contractors don't want me to be in that prime arena. Mm. Um, they want me to stay where I am. And um, that is the piece that with the DBE financial requirements and, and the different um, things that all of you have going on presently right now is um, we are capable to get to that next level, but we're sh strapped by other different pieces such as the financial capacity and um, our- Thank you, ma'am. My time has expired. I appreciate the, the answer and I yield back. And thank the gentleman. Uh, next, we'll go to Mr. Garcia for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Payne and uh, Chairman DeFazio for holding this very important uh, hearing on whether discrimination exists in federal passenger rail contracting. Congress recently passed historic infrastructure legislation that authorizes hundreds of billions of dollars in new infrastructure spending, including 66 billion for passenger and freight rail. As the US Department of uh, Transportation and state and local governments award contracts over the next few years to spend this historic amount of money, we must make sure that they include uh, disadvantaged business, business enterprises in those contracts, especially black, brown, and women-owned businesses. I want to thank our brave witnesses here today for sharing their harrowing and painful stories of how they face unjust discrimination as they sought to expand their contracting businesses. We must work in Congress to eliminate this insidious discrimination. Uh, a question for uh, Mr. Uh, Melvin Clark. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned how you established an office in Chicago and have worked su successfully with the Chicago Transit Authority, most notably with respect to the rehabilitation of the Dan Ryan portion of the red line. Uh, why have you had success in getting contracts from CTA and what lessons can Congress take away from what CTA has implemented in terms of disadvantaged business enterprise programs and goals? Well, one of the factors that I feel uh, has made a difference uh, for us is that we did something and were set, ex accepted by the minority community. Uh, when we came in to work on that project, we, as I told you, we went to the, uh, the churches and the Urban League and, and, and the city supported all of that. They saw people being hired and they saw uh, a positive difference being made in the community. And so we ended up becoming their contractor of choice, okay, because we were supported by, um, you know, more than just the fact that we can do the work, but that we were doing positive things. And we feel like, you know, our motto is to do well by doing good. And so local, local government made. Hello? Are you frozen? Hello? Yeah, we're having a bit of a technical difficulty here. Okay. 
See if we can get Mr. Right. Garcia back up. Okay. What we'll do here is um, go to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Carter, and we can come back um, to Mr. Garcia. Mr. Carter? Oh, we're having technical difficulties with everyone. We'll just um, be patient with us for a second, please. Just ask the witnesses to be patient with us for. Yeah. Please enter the meeting path. meeting now. Mr. Garcia, can you hear me? Mr. Garcia? Mr. 
Mr. Garcia, can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much, um, Mr. Chairman. I apologize, but I think we all had the some technical. Yes, I can. Okay, um, you can continue. Um, you have about three minutes left. And it's not working. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, sir, Mr. Clark. All right. Um, are, are we continuing? Or? Yes. Okay, well, he was talking about how the community and local government have embraced us. Uh, and I'm saying, yes, they have. But in fact, when I was working on the fast track program in Washington, they allowed me to come and recruit workers in Chicago. Uh, and we announced it on the radio, um, uh, some of the people that were, uh, and uh, the deputy mayor was fully supportive and us, actually we brought buses to bring down workers to give them opportunities again that we had that they didn't necessarily have in Chicago at the time. And those are the things that have endeared us to the community and the prime contractors know now that um, GW Peoples uh, makes a difference and, and that CTA and the local government is very pleased with what we do and the way we do it. And so we are getting more opportunities. And we felt like uh, it's not just low price that wins something, but it should be what difference are you making uh, in the community when you have these kind of opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Am I? Uh, yes, can you hear me, Chairman? Yes, now we can. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Okay. Um, my, last, my final question touched on the personal net uh, wealth cap of 1.32 million and how the cap uh, disadvantages DBEs. Can you expand on why the cap hurts the growth of DBEs and what you think uh, Congress, uh, if, if we should raise that cap? Yes, sir. Um, typically, that cap, where that cap comes into place where it's harmful, is in the bonding, bonding program. And if you own, if you're living in an area, the majority of the area of the country, like the Northeast or the Chicago or the West Coast, your home is 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 typically included in that equity the value. Of your home um, what is in, in the 8A program. It's not, but in the DOT programs, a lot of them they are, in any retirement uh, programs. So if you've already been established, you, you're you got to be very careful of not exceeding the cap. But in order to get the bonding you need, um, typically they're going to look at if you want a ten million dollar bonding program, you've got to have a million dollars in the bank somewhere before you, um, or you can't identify yourself. Meaning, if it all goes wrong, you get to give up everything you have. So. Um, Perhaps there's a need for legislation where for DBEs, you can, you can either do jobs that don't require the same level of bonding or some kind of tweak to the bonding program. That could be where it is for DBEs specifically, or um, some change on the jobs where the jobs are actually self-insured anyway, a, a majority of them, and the DBEs bonding is covered by the prime bond. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, much uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, we are going to have Mr. Carter for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to address this significant issue. Um, we know that DBEs historically have had a difficult time when cracking into the mainstream of doing business with uh, majority firms and even with the federal government. <laughs> Uh, we know that currently roughly 5% of federal contracting dollars go to minority-owned businesses. So that's that's something that we have to do, do, do a better job at. And I'm very proud that in this infrastructure bill, 
uh, establishes Minority Business Development Agency within the Department of Commerce. So to the panelists, I'd ask that you gather as many of your experiences as possible and share them with us in writing so that we can, um, as this development of the Minority Business Development Agency is, is armed, we can begin by giving them all of the horror stories of things that you've experienced. Um, I know that many times small businesses um, are choked when it comes to getting paid. The prime gets paid and then the sub is choked for 90, 120 days and beyond, oftentimes making it next to impossible to run a business because, uh, because you need your resources. Oftentimes to find that prime companies come in and then offer pennies on the dollar to close out a file where members have already, of the minority community, minority businesses, women-owned businesses have already expended resources. So I'd ask either of the panelists or all of you very briefly, because I've got a little bit of time to share your experiences as it relates to the process of getting paid. Um, once a prime has been paid, oftentimes subs are left on the sideline waiting to be paid, oftentimes getting far less. Um, can anyone speak to that? We, we have definitely, thank you, Congressman. We have definitely experienced that in terms of uh, getting late payments. And, 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 and as we speak right now, we have a very large national firm whose average AR days, that's the average number of days it takes them to pay us, is over 120 days. That goes to my second point in my testimony about the relationship and the difficulty of having a fair relationship with the bank because we have to borrow. We have to borrow. And, and I have had to write off or take less money on occasions to take care of this. But it, it's a lot of stress. There's no cash flow. And I absolutely have to and, that, and think that I don't want to cut you off. You got a little bit of time, but I agree. I pr appreciate that. I'd like to hear from a few other panelists as well. I'd, I'd like to address that as well. Um, what we found is also sometimes the culprit is the agency itself. Uh, so what we try to do is work with the agency to see if they can speed up the payment process internally, because that's what the prime is telling us is that they haven't been paid. So even though there is a prompt payment uh, uh, requirement in the contract. So we talk to the, pro uh, to the agency also and make them aware of how much the pain this causes us. And that sometimes sensitizes the agency to try to improve or monitor the invoicing cycle by the prime. But the, but the issue that I'm bringing forward is ones that I've heard a million times before. And while I acknowledge that the agency oftentimes could be the culprit, many times the culprit is a prime is paid and then withholds payment from the sub um, when you can least afford that. Can, I, I, can Mr. Clark, can you chime in for a brief second on that? And then I'm gonna ask you to do it in 10 seconds because I've only got a little over a minute left. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think that there should be some legislation uh, uh, regulations put in the DBE program where the minority business uh, contractors, subcontractors, the small business normally, um, is paid within 30 days. Are paid uh, at the same some, time they're, they're, with the prime, they're, right? They're, so when a prime is paid, they well, can pay but, you commensurate. Sometimes, but sometimes the prime is not paid because of their issues. And we, as a kind of sm small business, are sitting around waiting. We're in that situation right now, okay? We had nothing to do with them not being paid. However, you know, they're saying that, you know, we signed the same contract paid when paid. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, I think yeah, that, but, uh, go ahead. Mr. Clark, I'm sorry, I got 24 seconds. And it looks like Kenneth wants to jump in there real fast. Yeah. Can you do it in about five seconds? I think the best way is to have 14 day pay terms, just like this, uh, the Small Business Act is used with the 8A program. And you and Prime should be required to pay, even if they haven't been paid within those 14 days, and they can carry the cost of that in their contract to the owner. Right. In, closing, in closing, what I'd ask everyone to do is, as I started, cobble together as many of those experiences and give them to the committee in writing. Share with us your experiences. I mean, we all have limited time to talk today, but as this development of the Minority Business Agency comes about, we want to be able to think about those problems that you had and address them in as thoughtful a way as possible. Does us no good to have a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill 
if the people that are in the community that are been a, that have been negatively impacted the most never have an opportunity to participate to to share your professional um, knowledge, your skills, your wares. That's what we're here for to make sure that we have equity in federal government contracting, but also to make sure that we create opportunities across the board. So I know I'm out of town, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I yield back. No, thank you. The, the gentleman's comments are well received. Um, next, I will um, ask Ms. Steele if she has any questions for the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, actually, I submitted written questions. So I think uh, I'm going to stay as is because it's almost the same as uh, uh, Congressman Douglas Marfa because I was uh, quoting LA Times and uh, High Speed Rail. So I'm going to just um, submit the written statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes our hearing today. And I would like to Again, thank each of the witnesses for their testimony today. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. And the subcommittee stands adjourned.